the action on Wednesday of the American Congress to extend credit to Finland. Mr. A. Randall Elliott, research associate of the Foreign Policy Association, will discuss Scandinavia on the firing line. Mr. Elliott. Good afternoon. As Soviet troops continue their push through the Mannerheim line and occupy the outskirts of Viborg, Finland's second city, all Scandinavia sits on edge. Recent Soviet successes in Finland have created new worries for Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. These countries, already subjected to threats and hardships by Germany and the Allies, fear that a Soviet victory in Finland may be only the first step in Russia's historic westward drive for an ice-free port on the Atlantic, a drive that could succeed only at the expense of Sweden and Norway. The present Soviet offensive, one month old today, was apparently launched as an extreme effort to bring the Finns to terms before they receive substantial foreign reinforcements. It was also undertaken at this time because soon warm spring weather will make progress difficult along the marshy Karelian Isthmus. The Red Army began its power attack against Finland's Mannerheim line early in February, after making very little headway during two months of war all along the Russo-Finnish border. Paying dearly for every foot of land they won, Soviet troops finally approached Viborg on Friday morning, after exactly four weeks of strenuous attack through 30 miles of fortified territory. The fall of Viborg will not mean a final Russian victory. During the February campaign, Finnish workers have strengthened secondary defenses, and in the past week, the Finns have beat a strategic retreat to defend these points. Finnish strategy throughout the war has been to retreat, spread out, and then attack from the flanks. Behind their new positions, the Finns hope to maneuver the Russians as they did in December and in January. Their prospects for a successful counterattack now depend on the morale and degree of fatigue among their troops after the Russian drive. They realize all too well, however, that they cannot continue indefinitely without foreign assistance in men and equipment. For this assistance, they look primarily to their Scandinavian neighbors. During the past two weeks, President Kallio of Finland has repeatedly called for tangible and immediate aid. Foreign Minister Tanner journeyed several times to Stockholm, where he was reported to have asked the Swedish Premier for two divisions of the Swedish army. All of the Scandinavian peoples are exceedingly sympathetic toward the Finns in their struggle, and Sweden alone has sent them almost a hundred million dollars in cash and supplies. A leading Swedish military authority has published a pamphlet advocating immediate Swedish intervention on behalf of Finland. He expresses the conviction of many Scandinavians that Russia will not stop with the annexation of Finland. But the Swedish government, while tacitly encouraging volunteers to fight with the Finns, has prudently refrained from sanctioning official aid which would endanger its status as a neutral. It is not yet convinced that the USSR will drive on beyond Finland and prefers to sit tight rather than risk incurring German disfavor by openly sending Swedish troops against the Russians. Since the Nazi-Soviet pact was concluded last August, the German press, formerly very friendly toward Finland, has played down the Finns in their dealings with the Soviet Union. It has taken occasion again and again to berate the Finnish government for refusing a bilateral non-aggression pact with Germany last May. Sweden and Norway refused similar pacts at the same time. The northern countries now fear that Stalin's price for benevolent neutrality toward Hitler's war with the Western powers may have been a free hand for the Soviet Union in Scandinavia. The Reich maintains an active strategic and economic interest in this area, and it may be questioned whether Germany approves of Russian expansion there. But for the present, the Germans are primarily concerned with winning their war in the West. The German press has repeatedly warned the Scandinavian countries against unneutral collaboration with the Allies by accepting the British blockade and by favoring the Allies commercially. Germany has also warned these states not to permit Allied troops to pass through their territory to aid the Finns. The Felkischer Beobachter, official Nazi party newspaper, suggested that by continuing collaboration with England, the northern neutrals might all too easily be putting their existence at stake. For their part, The northern neutrals hope to avoid entanglement with any great powers. Upholding his government's middle way policy toward Finland, King Gustav has restated Sweden's official position. Swedish volunteers and troops may continue to aid the Finns in money, but no troops may go, nor may any foreign troops cross Swedish soil. 
The king explained that intervention by Sweden would mean not only war against Russia, but also involvement in the war between Germany, Britain, and France. His speech temporarily calmed Swedish activists who favor armed intervention against Russia before the Red Army reaches Sweden's own frontiers. A new crisis was barely averted, however, when the town of Pajala in eastern Sweden was bombed by planes which the Swedish government identified as Russian. Many Swedes fear that they are already so heavily committed to Finland that a few legal technicalities will make no difference in either Russian attitude or policy toward them. They also remember Soviet hostility last summer to the joint Finnish-Swedish plan for refortifying the Åland Islands, now a part of Finland. The USSR maintained that its interest in these strategic islands, which control access to Leningrad through the Gulf of Finland, is as great as that of Sweden, and Swedish interest in the islands is intense. They are only 25 miles off Sweden's coast, just north of Stockholm, and but seven miles from its own coastal waters. They are only a few minutes by air from its capital city, its heavy industries, its leading electric power plants, and its railroad nerve centers. The Swedes recall the powerful Oland Island fortress maintained by Imperial Russia until the mid-19th century, and fear that if Soviet Russia gains control over these territorial outposts, it will use them to dominate Sweden. What is the real nature of Russian interest in Scandinavia? The Soviet Union apparently is unconcerned with acquiring more land or raw materials. It now has over 8 million square miles of territory and abundant stores of natural wealth. It is, however, definitely interested in strengthening its strategic position against the other great states of Europe. The USSR seeks to maintain a threat value in the North that will assure it a voice in European diplomacy, such as Italy enjoys through its strategic position athwart the Mediterranean trade routes. No more, then, would Moscow be excluded from council chambers as at the Paris Conference in 1919 and at Munich in 1938. Whether the acquisition of Finland would adequately serve this end, or whether a victorious Russia would feel obliged to press on through Norway and Sweden to the Atlantic, depends in part on the extent of genuine cooperation between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. A Soviet invasion of the Scandinavian peninsula might bring direct military intervention by Britain and France. If supporting Norway and Sweden in a defensive war, Britain and France would be permitted to occupy these countries, which now bar their territory to all foreign troops. During recent weeks, there has been increasing evidence that the Allies would welcome an opportunity to extend the theater of war to Scandinavia, whence they could strike more decisively at the Germans. Germany, consequently, may be expected to exert whatever restraining influence it may have over Russia to confine the Red Army's activities to Finland. Should war expand into the Scandinavian peninsula, Germany would not only be open to attack from the north, but would also be deprived of essential iron supplies which it now occupies and obtains from the northern countries. Any extension of military activity by the Soviet Union, moreover, reduces Germany's likelihood of obtaining raw materials and foodstuffs from Russia. In the last analysis, the future of Scandinavia may depend upon a single question. Who is dominant in the Nazi-Soviet scheme, Hitler or Stalin? Winston Churchill, perhaps, thought of these things when he delivered his notable radio speech in January, urging the neutrals to make common cause with the Allies against Germany. While all Scandinavia broods under Nazi and Bolshevik threats, he asserted, only Finland shows what free men can do. In their earnest desire for neutrality, the northern countries were quick to criticize this bid for active support by the First Lord of the British Admiralty. Two weeks ago, however, Great Britain initiated an even more active campaign for influence in Scandinavia. The British destroyer Cossack rammed the German naval auxiliary Altmark against the ice and rocks along Norway's Jessing Fjord and released 299 British prisoners from the ship. The Altmark episode, more than any other single incident since the outbreak of war last September, illustrated the difficult position of Scandinavia between Germany and the Allies. It called attention to Germany's dependence upon Norwegian coastal waters for access to the open sea and for acquisition of iron ore from Sweden. Of greater significance, however, it revealed the British Admiralty's new determination to make the blockade against Germany effective, even though in doing so, British warships must enter neutral waters. This determination was further seen last week as a British naval patrol moved into Arctic waters off the northern coast of Norway. Some observers foresaw allied aid to Finland in this move, but neutral opinion generally held 
that the Arctic Patrol was intended primarily to intercept German ships returning home or trying to reach the open sea and to stop the shipment of Swedish iron ore to the Reich. Germany's two leading deficiencies in essential wartime commodities are oil and iron. As the allied German struggle for control over Romanian oil becomes sharper, the contest for Swedish iron ore also intensifies. Cut off by the British blockade from many of its normal sources of iron, Germany must have the Swedish ore to carry on the war. While the Baltic supply route is frozen over, Germany can obtain the required shipments only through the ice-free Norwegian Atlantic port at Narvik, where the ore is sent by rail from Sweden. An important outcome of the Altmar crisis may be an allied attempt to intimidate Norwegian authorities into discouraging the transit of ore through their waters. Germany, however, can be expected to use all the persuasion and threat of force at its disposal to block these efforts. Realizing this, the Norwegian government will doubtless seek to continue its present policy of insisting on its neutral rights in the war. The Swedish government has thus far avoided friction with both belligerents over its iron by permitting sales of the ore to all countries, only in the same ratio established for these sales in normal peacetime trade. As the war intensifies, however, the belligerents may seek to control Sweden's valuable exports by withholding shipments of other commodities which the Swedes find it necessary to import. The same economic weapon was applied against all of the Scandinavian countries by both sides during the World War, working serious handicaps uh, and hardships on these small nations. Denmark's foodstuffs, Norway's fisheries, the Swedish and Norwegian wood products, all are coveted by the powers at war. Unlike the United States, these small Scandinavian countries cannot withdraw their ships from the seas and live on their own resources. They require food and manufactured products which they do not themselves possess. And in order to pay for these necessary imports, they must sell their surplus goods abroad. The volume of their foreign trade per person is larger than that of any other European country. They must trade to live. And their very existence is threatened by the restrictions of the Allied blockade and the violence of German naval warfare. Already since September, 110 of their merchant ships have been reported sunk. The meeting of Scandinavian foreign ministers last Sunday and identical Scandinavian protests to each belligerent government on Thursday were designed to meet these problems. The protests, however, were promptly rejected. Denmark, Norway and Sweden all remained neutral throughout the World War, while the United States became involved in spite of its great distance from Europe. Scandinavian diplomacy is sorely tested, however, in its attempt to solve the problems facing it today. After only six months of the present war, complicated as it is by the Soviet invasion of Finland, the northern neutrals appear closer to involvement than at any time from 1914 to 1918. Mr. A. Randall Elliott, research associate of the Foreign Policy Association, was today's speaker in the 17th broadcast of the series America Looks Abroad. As an added feature of this program, part of next week's period will be devoted to answering your questions concerning the facts behind the headlines. Also, you may have a free copy of the weekly bulletin written by the people you hear on this program. To obtain that bulletin, address your letter or postcard to the Foreign Policy Association, number 8 West 40th Street, New York City. Foreign Policy Association, number 8 West 40th Street, New York City. Tune in next Sunday to hear another speaker in the America Looks Abroad series. This is the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York.